So on this podcast, we talk a lot about our role, our responsibility for creating a great team culture. Yet we know that our athletes, they have a responsibility as well for the culture. The type of teammate they are can both positively and negatively impact the team. Thus, it's our responsibility as coaches to support their growth, to challenge them to become better teammates. Well, what does that look like? How do we do that without falling back into old habits like lecturing them about what it means to be a good teammate? Well, growth is experiential. It requires adversity, reflection, and support. Sports provide a lot of that adversity. We can be that support, and we can encourage that reflection. Today, we're going to talk a lot about that with our friend, John O'Sullivan, who's been a frequent guest in the podcast. John has authored three books now, Changing the Game, Every Moment Matters, and his most recent book is The Championship Teammate, which he wrote with Dr. Jerry Lynch. And in today's conversation, we'll be discussing a little bit about the book, but more so about how we can help our athletes become better teammates. Welcome to the Coaching Culture Podcast. I'm your host, J.P. Nurbin, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Nate Sanderson. The mission of this podcast is to help you become a better leader and build a better culture. In addition to this podcast, I'm the founder of TOC, which provides one-on-one coaching and consulting for leaders. Learn more about us at tocculture.com. This episode is brought to you by the TOC newsletter. Every Thursday, our newsletter includes two things you don't want to miss out on. Firstly, the notes to that week's podcast episode. Whether you're listening while driving the car, out for a run, or doing the dishes, we don't want you to miss the biggest takeaways from each episode. Secondly, each newsletter is a short article from myself or Nate on leadership and culture. These articles are designed to inspire, encourage, and provide practical insights into leadership and culture building. Our content is a perfect fit for anyone who wants to stay up to date with the latest trends and insights in culture building. You can subscribe to the newsletter at tocculture.com or by clicking on the link in the details of each episode. Well, John, before we get into a little bit of the content of the book, I'm, I'm curious as your perspective on this. It, you know, what do you think when you, you've obviously done a lot of work with a lot of teams and a lot of coaches as we have, what are some of the biggest challenges for players today when it comes to trying to live out some of the values and characteristics that you talk about in the book? What are the obstacles that, I mean, well, obviously we face them and we see them as coaches, but it's really, as you mentioned, the athletes that have to get over these hurdles. What's holding them back? Well, I mean, Nate, you're, you're neck deep in high school sports for, for many years now. So you see this every single influence in the life of today's teenager says, get attention for yourself. Look at me, um, make money, uh, get my stats, get noticed, right? That's what everything is telling all these kids. And then yet, we're trying to bring a group of kids together and combat music, video, TikTok, popular culture, everything that says, look at me and, and teach them, look at us, right? And teach them, how do I give something that I could get myself, but how do I give for the, for the betterment of, of the group? And, um, you know, we're, we're part of teams our whole lives. And, this is the thing like what it's church it's it's our family it's our community it's the the people we work with so we always tell people like oh you need to be a great teammate you need to learn how to be collaborative and do all these things but we don't really teach them how to do it and so we said well what better than youth sport or high school sports or college sports to learn how to be a great teammate and if you become a great teammate you'll always be in demand in your life Right. If you can work well with others, and when I say JP, Nate, right, you're on my group, and I'm going to add you because I know that you're going to make us better. You're always going to be in demand, and so I I think it's just it's a really hard world that kids grow up in. There's so many distractions, and there's so many things telling them the exact opposite of what makes them be a great teammate. That that we as coaches have to be super intentional about teaching this to our kids. One of the things I liked that you shared earlier, John, is you know you said this is a book for teams about how to be a better teammate, not just like a book for an athlete to read in the off season. And going through the book, it is that it's for teams, and I think that just speaks to the experience of becoming a better teammate cannot be done in isolation. It's not done by you know 
the athletes sitting down and reading the book for the summer. It's it's through this team experiential learning. Much like you becoming a better teammate with Jerry requires you guys to actually engage and work on a project on something. And I, I think that that is one thing that makes the book really, really special. And I, I'm curious if you just could comment on that and just some of your experience in working with teams and how that relates. Yeah. I mean, of course, I would like people, the individual athlete, to pick up this book or their parents get it for them and, and say, hey, uh, this is, you know, read this, right? But ultimately, you rely on the others around you. And so what we wanted to do was write a book that, you know, sh it's short chapters. You could spend 15 minutes at a practice, you read it, and then there's discussion questions, right? And there's places in the book to reflect as an individual. And then there's places in the book that you can reflect and share as a group amongst your team of what do we have to start doing? What do we have to stop doing? What do we have to keep doing? All these different things. And so, um, you know, but, but it's just this togetherness. I, I, I mean, I, I think you guys, we, you, the three of us have had this discussion many times that when we think about what is great coaching and, and what do we have to be intentional about as coaches, oftentimes the things that are most important are not taught to us as coaches. They're not in any coaching manual anywhere. And so we have to, as I think, a, as intentional transformational coaches, if you want to use that word, say, well, what, what drives joy in sports and positive team dynamics and all that is one of the big things. Well, if that's what drives joy, then let's intentionally teach it. Let's bring our team together. Let's get everyone on the same page because it's going to be a better experience for the kids. And and again, you don't have to wait till high school. Like, I mean, I run a program for eight and nine year olds. You know, I have 32 kids last night. Well, you know, you know, one of the things is eight, nine year olds really are, I think, since COVID, especially struggling to listen and sit still and, and learn. And, and so they do a lot of things that are disrespectful to people. And in my soccer group, you know, sometimes it's, they're just, you know, whacking soccer balls around and shooting balls when people are cleaning up or whatever. Well, someone's going to get hit. Well, last night someone got hit and it was me and I was not happy. Right. And, 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 but so it, what did we do? What's one of the things we value? Like we talk about this with eight, nine-year-olds. What's something that you said you want in your teammate? Well, one of the words was respect, right? So if I say, don't shoot a ball and you shoot a ball, is that respectful? No, that's really disrespectful and it's dangerous, right? And here's what happened. And this is why we say that. So if you want to respect your teammates, when the coaches say, clean up, clean up. When the coaches say, bring it in, bring it in right? Because it can hurt someone. And you're lucky you hit me, not someone else. Though I didn't sleep well last night. I'm mad. I'm very angry right now. <laughs> John, you're speaking right into my life. I live with an eight-year-old <laughs> going on nine here. So uh, <laughs> I'm having all sorts of imagery running through my mind here. Um, yeah, man, I have teenagers. They just think I'm dumb, right? They, they, they listen, but they don't think I'm telling the truth. The eight and nine-year-olds just don't even listen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I got that to look forward to, I guess. <laughs> John, when you and Jerry put the book together, you kind of divided it out into three segments or three um, partitions of the book here. And you settled on these three words of starting with connection and then learning to compete and then learning to lead. You and I could have probably sat at a whiteboard and listed a thousand words that you could have chosen in order to you know, settle on kind of what are the three most important to be a great teammate. Why did you guys settle on those three, connect, compete, and lead? Hmm. That's a great question. And it's obviously the essence of, of the book. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, a, as we worked through titles and sections, when, when we came up with all the topics at first, we we're like, well, how do these break up? Right. And, and you know, the, the first word we started talking about, which I think is the foundation of, of coaching and the foundation of great teams is is love right like love is about you know the selflessness and connection and all these different things and if you have a lot of love for your teammates and they have a lot of love for you that's when you're going to perform your best now love doesn't mean i like you in every moment 
but it's this deep, profound respect and appreciation for another person. So we, so we, we settled, we, we, we talked about the word love in the subtitle. Um, but you know, it's, it's hard, like, you know, how do you explain that and all this sort of stuff. So then we just sort of shifted to connect. Right. And, and so that section's all about how do we come together and, and love each other? And of course we're in competitive sports, so we want to compete. And I've never met a coach who's like, oh, you know, I don't want a competitive environment and practice, or I don't want some tips on how we can compete harder. Um, and, and so obviously that was the second. And then like leadership, like we we have to develop leaders so that it's not the coach just in charge of everything. Eventually the team takes it over itself. And And when your team leaders and your upperclassmen are the ones doing all the little things and leading by example and mentoring the young players, that then you got it right that then you know it but i mean so many of the teams that i get brought in on um especially high school level it's not as bad in college but certainly in high schools like you walk in and all the seniors tell the stories about how poorly they were treated as freshmen um and how they can't wait to do the same to next year's freshmen right and you're like man like don't don't you get it like someone's got to break the cycle. It didn't work for you. If you break the cycle, right, when that freshman is on the line in the state tournament with a one-on-one to, you know, to win the game, what are they thinking, right? Are they loved, respected, connected, an important part of the group, or have they been crapped on all year long um, and, and made to pick up the balls and get the water and just, you know, not served at all? Right? Are they what? What puts them in the best state of mind to make that shot? Because you're going to rely on them at one point in your last year to bail you out. Are they going to be in a, a spot to do that or not? And so, um, so that's leadership. And again, we don't really we we ask kids to be better leaders. We don't teach them a lot. John, one of the most common phrases I hear from coaches when they're dealing with, I think, what they would call a difficult teammate is, yeah, 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 Nate, but he just doesn't get it. She doesn't get it. They don't get it. You don't understand, as you mentioned, their parents or their friend group or the coach they had last year or their club coach. Or, you know, there's all of these excuses, I think, that as coaches we line up. And, you know, obviously all of those things do influence how that young individual is going to interact on our team. But what encouragement can you give to coaches that are just sort of frustrated with, that's just the way that they are. You don't get it. That's, that's how they are. Um, to continue to try to to persevere and be that positive influence for those what seem like difficult to reach players. I mean, I can't imagine, Nate, if someone came to your basketball team and was shooting 40% from free throws, you wouldn't be like, yeah, they just can't shoot free throws. You'd be like, okay, well, let's stay after. How do we fix this? And I mean, I think this is the thing. Character development is the same thing. And, And it's not, you know, it's not your fault how a kid arrives, their parents, their previous coaches, whatever. It's not your fault. But I mean, I, I think it's our responsibility how they leave, how we move them towards something that will be more beneficial in their life. And I see a lot of coaches advocating that responsibility because the kid's good, they score points, the parents are hard, you know, hard to deal with, whatever. But I really think we need schools and athletic directors bought in and that as a coach I can go in and be like all right this kid is tough and this is what's going on um but why is i mean again why is that kid tough well it's because what's happening at home well again this is a young kid it's that's not their fault either so to to give up on them is, is terrible now i think at some point as a coach you have a right to teach and teach and teach and teach and and then say, if you don't get this, then you just can't be part of the group anymore because your 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 actions are dragging everyone else down. And for every coach, that's a different tipping point. And for every program, that's a different tipping point as well. But I often think that the kids have the mo- who have the most issues are often the ones that need our sport the most. <laughs> 
So I try not to take the easy way out of, oh, let me just kick them off the team. But sometimes you have to do that as well. Yeah, I think you bring up, you know, a very important point that probably triggers some people that are listening to this because it's like, oh, we we got to be able to make it work for everyone. Um, but in our experience, sometimes that separation and that removal from the team, when it's done in a respectful way and, and honors them and as a human being, um, it, it honestly becomes the game changing moment that that transformation for that individual. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, th- their ability to reflect on that and learn from that experience. And so I think that that's really, really profound. One of the things that I really appreciate about the book as well is, is the direct applications for teams. And each chapter has different activities that you can do with your team with, and, and they're great stuff. And I'm just curious, of all those activities, what's maybe one of your favorites that you could share with coaches and, and maybe ta- you, know, you could share a little about the theme as well for that chapter? You know, we in, in the introduction of the book, we we talk about essential questions. And so in a lot of the chapters, the discussion point is around sort of these three essential questions that on most any topic you can do, right? And so let's think about like, um, you know, like I, I talked about before, like, Okay, so like one of my favorite chapters was one, you know, being a, be a thermostat, not a thermometer, right? And this idea that a, a thermometer takes the temperature of the room and a thermostat adjusts it. And, and, and great teammates, you know, have to learn how to take the temperature up sometimes. Hey, we're not focused. We're not working hard. We're not competing hard enough. And also how to take it down. Right when the referee or the officials making bad calls, when um, people are are too tense, when um, things aren't going well, you just relax. Right, like how do we kind of get back to the focus? And so, um, what like one of the typical things we might say is, um, all right, what are, what's one of the things that we are doing right now that we need to stop doing if we're going to you know, be thermostats and not thermometers. What's something that we need to start doing that we're not doing now if we're going to do this? And and what's something that we need that we are doing that we need to keep doing because it's really beneficial to do this? So in most chapters, we 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 pose those questions because because you know teams aren't always doing everything wrong and they're not ever doing everything right. There's always some margin that you can gain. And so, hey, there's three groups in your team right there. Break up into three groups. What do we need to stop doing? What do we need to start doing? What do we need to keep doing? And it's great discussion. And then they share with the team. And then 15, you know, 10 minutes later, you're back out on the field. And now you're looking for these moments of 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 these different things. So, um, and and I think, you know, if you coach girls, you might run into different issues than when you coach boys, um, older, younger, all these different things. Like I just said, with eight, nine year olds, you know, there, you know, there's different, there's different things that, I mean, in, in the 16 year old boys team that I coach, you know, we talk about how we communicate to each other. I mean, a lot of teenage boys, just whatever crosses their mind just spills out of their mouth. Right. And it's not always helpful and it doesn't make the people around them better. And how could you say that differently? Right. Or I have like a great kid on the team who just he's such a positive leader that he makes people around him play better and he makes people around him feel better with everything he says and and he does. And it's wonderful. And people want to play with him. And then there's other players who are super competitive. And sometimes it doesn't manifest itself in the right way. And like can you move yourself a little bit towards that? Don't change who you are, but recognize how he lifts, he, he elevates people. <laughs> and sometimes you, you, you bring it to the bottom floor. I can imagine that, that those activities would be so impactful, especially if the coach was invested or the coaches were invested and in doing the activity as well and, and reflecting on their own behaviors. And for that example, the thermostat or, you know, a thermometer, you know, it's just how, how am I a thermometer? How am I a thermostat and a coach's vulnerability and willingness to share and willingness to actually hear from the players around the moments that they're just an obnoxious thermometer. Um, you know, and just that communication, I can just imagine that being so impactful. 
and then I mean, as you guys know, just the coach being involved, a coach being vulnerable, a coach admitting that you're wrong is one of the most powerful things ever, right? That didn't come out the right way. I, I messed that up. I got the tactics wrong. Um, you know, that's on me, right? And so if I accept some blame, then my players are also much more likely to be like, yeah, and I could do this and I could do that. So, and again, this this idea, like how many coaches lose their head on the sideline when there's bad officiating or something like that, and then expect their team to remain calm. So you're supposed to be the adult in the room and you're not remaining calm. How are they going to remain calm? This episode is brought to you by the Culture System Online Training Platform. It's the ultimate resource for coaches who want to become more transformational and build winning team cultures. Whether you're just starting out or looking to take your coaching to the next level, our one-of-a-kind online training platform is designed to help you learn the culture system framework at your own pace. Through this course, I'll share with you the proven methods, tools, and strategies used by some of the best teams and organizations in the world. You'll get access to customizable digital tools and a group chat to engage with experienced coaches and apply the four-part framework throughout your season. With the Culture System Online Training, you'll be inspired and transformed through the stories and lessons of real leaders who've successfully applied these methods and tools within their organizations. You'll gain a deeper commitment to transformational coaching and be equipped with the tools and strategies you need to build a great team culture. To get access to this course today, simply go to tocculture.com and click on the Online Course tab or click on the link provided in the details of this episode. Don't miss this opportunity to become a more transformational coach and take your team to the next level with the Culture System Online Training Platform. John, I wonder, I remember reading uh, Sam Walker's book, The Captain of the Class, and in that book he talked about, you know, he went back and looked at all these successful teams and all these sports, and it felt like the book was really written about the surprise, you know, that it wasn't always the best player that was the most influential leader. In fact, most of the time it wasn't on those teams that he looked at. And sometimes we have authors on the program here. I, I'm just curious, you know, was, were there any surprises when you guys were putting the book together, starting to research a little bit more into some of the stories that you shared? Was there anything that caught you off guard a little bit when it came to studying what makes a champion teammate? That's a great question. Um, you know, I mean, I think we, you know, where, where is like Sam Walker, was a data analytics guy, right? And he really dove into this to a try to define who are the best teams of all time. Right. And, and then, and then B, what was the commonality, right? That's not what this book was. So it wasn't diving into a lot of research where all of a sudden the research said, ha, wow, never thought of that. Um, so no, in that regard, but I do think the point being that's really important out of that book is oftentimes, you know, we make our captain, oh, it's just the best player, but oftentimes they don't necessarily best epitomize what we value, right? Which is this selflessness or, or this, this positive attitude or things like that. And, and so just because someone's the best player doesn't mean they're the best leader. And, and that book is just fascinating for the people it, it, it points out, but and then there are like super examples, right? And we talk in the book about Tim Duncan. And, you know, one of the things is is humility. And it's just, you know, it's just a great story. After the year after he retired, he was helping prepare a rookie for preseason. The rookie was like super out of shape. And he's doing a Tim Duncan workout with, you know, 40-year-old Tim Duncan. And the rookie just vomits all over the court. He's just getting crushed. He vomits everywhere. Tim Duncan runs over to the side, grabs the towel, comes out and mops up the kid's vomit for him and then says, let's go get back out there. Right now, here you are, Hall of Famer, multiple time all star, multiple time NBA champ, wiping up the rookie's vomit. Would that happen in most high school programs? Heck no. Right. And not, the team wouldn't even take care of it. They'd expect the janitor to do it or whatever, right? And so it's like that sign of humility, how does that influence everyone around you in, in a massive, massive way? Um, so, yeah, so I, I think, you know, I, I think there's lots of examples out there um, 
of great leaders and as coaches, whatever our sport, find them, highlight them, (laughs) use them as lessons um, instead of, you know, because if we just watch ESPN, we're not really understanding leadership. We're not understanding what makes someone a great teammate. Every once in a while it gets highlighted, but not often enough. There's a question I have for you. You mentioned earlier, you're still coaching, you know, and you're running that group of eight, nine year olds. You got a ball in the head yesterday. And that's obviously a point of frustration for you still this morning. But I'm curious, as you're writing this book, you have a lot of idealistic visions of, or we have this, you know, idealistic vision of, of what a great teammate is. And I, and I wonder in your own experience as a coach, what are some of the things that you're, you, you that, what are some things that frustrate you that help to motivate you to write this book when you're mm-hmm. working with athletes today? I, I ask that because I think people hear yourself. I think they hear Nate and, you know, some of these other great coaches and they think, oh, they, they, these guys are perfect. Like they got it together. There's no, it's easy going. Like they've got all the tools, the tricks. I mean, and, and I just know that's not the case. And so I'm curious, what are some of your own frustrations as a coach that help, you know, motivate you in the writing of the book? Yeah, I would say, first of all, um, one of the points that we make really clearly is that it be, you know, that it's not about becoming a great teammate as much as it is being a great teammate. It's a state of being. It's a state of how you are and how you show up every day is is being this champion teammate, right? And what's a champion? It's It's doing the best that you have with what you have in the moment. Right. That's what a champion is, um, that that's what a high performer is. Um, <clears throat> so for, for me, I mean. The, I, again, the, the frustrations is no matter what you teach and do, you still as a coach only have those kids a couple hours a week. The other influences in their life are going to be far more influential than you are. So I, I would say my biggest personal frustration is when. You have this great teachable moment because uh, an athlete has faced some sort of adversity and here you are doing the right things and then the teachable moment gets undone by a parent, right? Who who sweeps in and protects their child from this moment of adversity and, and, and protects and, and basically prevents a great learning opportunity for the human being, right? So they protect them from consequences of bad actions. They protect them from, um, be, you know, being put in a difficult situation where maybe their playing time is not what they wanted, or the position they're playing, or all this sort of stuff. And they go in and they undercut trust in the coach, and they undercut trust in the program. And that kind of stuff is the most frustrating thing for me because it's so, um, it's selfish. And it's also the exact worst thing you could do for a child in that moment, right? You're, you're, you are, you are, you are slowing down their development and their growth because at some point in their life, you're not going to be there, right? And what's going to happen then? We're like, but every time else I've messed up, mom and dad have swooped in. Well, they're not going to your boss, you know, in your company, or I mean, some do. Don't get me wrong, like this does happen now, but you get laughed right out the door. Like, are you kidding me? Right. And so, I, I mean, I think th- this is it that if you get benched, if you're not playing as many minutes as you want in a sport, this has zero effect on the rest of your life. But man, if your parent in that moment says, well, what are you going to do about it, Nate? Right. Are you show up early? Do you stay late? Are you doing extra? Are you going to the gym? Are you doing all these different things? Um, why don't you go earn those minutes back? That kid, when he or she earns those minutes back, is going to be a better human being for it. And every time adults intervene and prevent that from happening, that's what frustrates me most. I think you'd get a chorus of amens on that, John, from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to ask you one more here as we kind of get ready to wrap up here today. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Bill Belichick, he says, I listen to him on a podcast, and he does not do very many podcasts. They, they were talking about the Patriot way, and they were asking him, you know, how do you indoctrinate players when they come into New England? And one of the things that they shared was that we tell them there's an expectation here 
that there's going to come a moment when you're going to have to choose between what's best for you and what's best for the team. Mm. And here we expect you to choose what's best for the team. Mm. And I think a lot of coaches hear that and they think, yeah, that's right. That's right. But as you've said over and over in our conversation today, there isn't any follow-up to that. You know, at the professional level, it's like, well, if you make the choice, what's best for you, we'll just cut you and find somebody else. But we don't always have that luxury. And I think there's a theme throughout the book of, you know, you talked about love earlier. That's really an other focused, you know, mentality, right? When you talk about compassion in the book, when you talk about humility in the book, you talk about connection, all of these things are others focus, you know, and mm -hmm. selflessness is right in line with that. I think is one of the hardest things for coaches to cultivate. So maybe just, you know, as we kind of wrap up here, because I don't know if any of this works without being able to develop that, that mentality or that uh, approach for a player of, we do have to consider those around us. How does a coach go about doing that for a player? Mm, that's a, another awesome question. I think I love that Bill Belichick quote, and I, I've heard, Pete Carroll say something similar. I've heard Steve Kerr say something similar. I mean, at that level, putting the team first, you know, because your screw ups are very, very public, right? And so when you have these opportunities to make this decision of what do I do versus what does the team do? And, and it's hard because I think also as a professional athlete, sometimes you have to make decisions for yourself, right? Like, I mean, certainly no, no one could argue that in professional football for many, many decades and even still to today, right? It was what's best for the program meant putting a player with a concussion back in the game, right? How do you say, you know what? Nah, this isn't for the team right now. I have a bad head injury. So, so it, it's a balance, right? But um, I, I think the other point is it hasn't always worked out for the Patriots, right? Like people will make bad decisions and it's what you do as a coach in those moments. Like, do you condone the behavior by ignoring it or do you condemn it and do you teach? And I think those of us, the younger, you know, with the young children you're working with, we're teaching behaviors, right? And, and so you can't overlook bad behaviors, right? I couldn't overlook getting plunked in the head last night any more so than I could overlook that kid plunking someone else in the head last night. I have to immediately deal with that because that's not okay. And and I think this is this is the thing is that you have this standard. Someone breaks the standard, you call it out. It's not a wrong standard because someone broke it. They broke it because they're a kid and they don't know any better and their brain doesn't work well or whatever. And so you, you know, you just have to, you just have to, you know, the standards are there for a reason. And I, I think your, your standards over a long coaching career, maybe don't change how they look, how they're implemented. Um, that might change, but putting the team first is a, is a great standard. Well, what does that look like for our group this year? Um, and I think that's, that's a wonderful one that a lot of teams use. And, and I think it's, I think it's pretty powerful. I, I think what, it was really profound that you shared moments earlier was that things won't go well at certain moments. They'll drop below the standard and it's how we don't condone that, but we call that out and we teach that and we see those as teachable moments. And I think coaches that read, you know, roll this book out with their, their team. I think so often coaches do these book studies. They're like, Oh, if we read the book, then we'll have great character. If we read the book. We'll be a great team. If we read the book, we'll have better leaders. It's like, no, the, 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 the book is the tool that then gives you the teachable moments. Mm -hmm. The moments that the character grows and they become better teammates is the moments that they fail. Mm -hmm. that's, that's it. Where the resistance becomes too much for them. They're too tired. They don't want to move the goals. They're, they're, they're in their own head because they're not playing as much time. Like That's where it happens. And I think you know, your book is such a great tool. And I hope the coaches that do pick it up, because I know so many will, I hope they go, okay, well, if they don't have great teammates, they blame John O'Sullivan because they didn't have great teammates that year if they read the book. No, it's on the coach now to actually go out and teach. And this is just a tool to help them in those moments. Yeah, it's it's the tool to go back and let's, hey, let's do this chapter again. Let's talk about this again. I, I mean, I always say it's like this, like no one just goes, right, all right, it's preseason. We're doing fitness. Now we're done. 
right? We don't do one day of fitness and then say, oh, well, we don't have to do fitness anymore. No, we do it every time. Well, character development should be woven into every practice and every week, right? And you're sitting on, I mean, I I think about, oh, I don't have time to do this. Like you have an hour's drive to your game. You can't do it on the bus, Mm -hmm. right? You couldn't spend 15 minutes on the bus versus all the kids on their screens doing whatever. Like, no, spend some time, read a chapter, have some discussion groups, use that time wisely. So this is just like anything else, right? We work on our offense all year. We work on our defense. We work on our fitness uh, and we work on our mentality and our character development so that they're all constantly getting developed over the course of the season. All right, that's it for our conversation with John. You can check him out at changingthegameproject.com. Also, you can pick up his book on Amazon. It is The Championship Teammate, and he wrote it with our other good friend, Dr. Jerry Lynch. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to this podcast. Also, leave us a review and share the podcast with some other friends of yours that might find some value in it.